Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. We have a CRT on the bench today, and the 80s called, and they want their monitor back because uh, this Panasonic Beauty it just screams the 1980s. Now, one of the cool things which I really like about this monitor, yes, it does have a kind of a gray plastic shell with some lines in it, of course. One of the things I like about it, of course, it has this glass front panel, and it's not plastic, this is actual glass here. And it was very much something that happened in the 80s, and there are these little things up here that you slide over to the side, like that. I hope that didn't break. And this one, which way does it go? That way. And that would release this. No, they did not break, luckily, and you pull that out. So for cleaning, you remove the glass. Whoops, the little plastic piece just fell down. We'll just stick that right there. And I crawled around on the floor to find the other little plastic clip. These seem pretty fragile, but they haven't broken after all this time. Um, uh-oh. What's this? Oh, there's just some schmutz on there. It's like soot or something. So not broken, luckily. And now it allows this to be cleaned. Now, I have a feeling it's pretty dirty. <laughs> Let's grab the Windex. Uh, yeah. Not too bad, actually. Could have been a lot worse. Most people who had these monitors back in the day would never actually attempt to clean behind the glass because, you know, they didn't really think about it. They might clean on the front side of the glass, the part they could access very easily. But due to the high voltage and the static that would go on on the front of the CRT, definitely attracts a little bit of dust and whatnot. So it kind of would make everything a little blurry and a little... A little dark. Now the weird thing is there's a strange sort of mottled texture to the CRT glass here, which is a little unusual. But anyways, okay, I don't know. So this monitor here was given to me. It was saved from e-waste as usual on my channel. I don't know if it works, no idea about it, but it's got a couple interesting things. I've called it a monitor, but it's actually a TV and a monitor combined. Let's start on the front left. We have a power button, and this is a soft button. It's not actually uh, a toggle switch or anything. It's just a momentary button. We have the adjustment controls here for the picture, and this one says contrast, parentheses, computer, vertical hold, sharpness. This says panabrite, then brightness, tint, and color. Panabrite was probably something to do with the white level, like what Sony calls picture or typically contrast on most sets, but actually adjust the overall white level. Now these two things here are actually buttons. The V-hold button up at the top, it's gonna be not possible to see on the camera, but it says manual and auto. And then this button right here says color pilot on and off. So there's like an automatic color control. Now you will have already noticed that the front door is missing and that's really unfortunate because I'm sure it was a nice silver plastic to match the rest of the monitor and it will be impossible for me to find such a thing to complete the look of this. Looks like the original door just had little plastic standoffs that went into the hole there and then one on this side and then it would have had a latch right here. The click in, click out kind. It kind of grabs onto the little prong that would have been on the door. So that works. The holes are fine, but the door is missing. So if anyone out there has a door for this, I mean, I know the odds are basically like one in a billion. Uh, let me know because, well, if this monitor works, that'll make this thing look pretty sweet. Moving on, we have a power LED, a computer LED, a toggle switch for computer, we have a TV video momentary switch. So yes, that does belie the fact that this has composite video inputs on the back. Volume up, down, channel up, down, momentary switches. I'm assuming this is an IR receiver here, but maybe it is not. Maybe it's a little LED display. Judging by the small size of it though, I'm thinking this is an infrared remote receiver. I do not have the remote for this set. And the last thing is it says Omni series right here in a sort of a shiny red label. All right, so let's turn this around and I have it sitting on a cloth because <laughs> it's so heavy. This monitor is so unbelievably heavy. It's, it's a 13 inch screen here and the, the weight is ridiculous. Um, it's plastic on the outside, but it just must have a ton of circuitry and metal on the inside to make it as heavy as this. I don't think I've ever felt a heavier 13 inch monitor and I have a lot of 13 inch monitor. Commodore 1084 or say Commodore 1702, Nothing compared to how heavy this thing is. It's ridiculous. 
Uh, we have a speaker on the side here. It's just mono, so it's got one speaker, but you can see the 80s grooves here. There's also a headphone jack down on the corner there. And let's keep going around in the back. So on the other side, it's just more grooves, but there is no actual uh, speaker over there. All right, so on the back here, it says Panasonic Color TV Model CTF-1465R, 120 volts, average 82 watts. There is a manufacturer date, 1984, September. We have a chassis number, NMX-GXSD. And then here's the model number again, CTF-1465R. Of course, this set is made in Japan, but distributed by Panasonic Company, a division of Matsushita Electric Corp of America. Up here we have the RF. Now there's this little pigtail here, which is actually just part of the set. And as there it is, the F connector, 75 ohm input. And I'm pretty sure what's happening here is you can hook up rabbit ears to these screw terminals. And instead of giving you a little adapter to go from screw terminals to 75 ohm, you just push this right here into that little connector there. It's basically a male connector that joins up with the female F connector to adapt the screw terminals to the 75 ohm that the tuner inside the set obviously uses. On the back here, where the CRT neck board would be behind this, as is usual with Panasonic, they offer some controls here. We have two drive controls, red and blue, and then low light, which I assume is the bias control for red and blue as well. Do not remove this plate, serviceman adjust only. Hmm, but wait, on the back, we have more inputs and more outputs. So it looks like we have video input right here along the top, and this says computer audio, which is gonna be for this, which is an RGB input. Now this weird connector, you might be wondering what this is. This is a Japanese standard connector that was very common on Japanese monitors back in the early 80s for RGB input. Can sometimes carry composite, like certain Sony VCRs I think use this, but I'm pretty sure in this case, this is going to be RGB. It'll probably be TTL RGB, although I've seen analog over this connector as well. And then I think what we have here is through output, which means it loops the input through to the output. And then down here, it says TV out. So this will be the output of the tuner, which is kind of cool. You could hook it up to a second monitor or for instance, a VCR directly. And then we have some more controls, vertical size. This has the service switch right here. And then over here is the RF AGC adjustment. So automatic gain control for the RF. And then there's some more controls hidden over here. We have computer white balance, R and B, and then a brightness control, probably for the computer as well. Horizontal center, and then a focus control. It looks like there's a control you can actually access in there. So quite a lot of external controls on this monitor. It's pretty surprising. But wait, there's more. On the top of the set, in a very interesting position, there's actually a tuner control setup thing here. So AFT automatic fine tuning, on or off. Cable TV switch here for the type of cable TV you have, either standard TV or it's three different modes of cable TV. You can add and erase channels. So this must have some kind of on-screen display, I guess. And then it says slow and fast for time. So maybe there's a clock in this as well. I have to say that seems quite fancy if something like a computer monitor here, which is mainly what this is, from 1984 would have on-screen displays with time and the channel number. So, all right, so the question is, does this thing even work? How worn out is it? Because we all know CRTs get really worn. So I think I'm gonna pop the cover off before I turn this on, just to take a look at how worn out this thing looks. It was really dirty when I got it. I gave it a little bit of a clean, but you can't really tell from external dirt how used up a CRT is, because of course that external dust could easily just happen when this thing has been stored and not even used. So I'm going to put on some gloves, as I like to do when I'm working on an unknown and old monitor because it's really dirty inside. Now let's take the back cover off. So as is very typical with Japanese electronics in the 80s, there are arrows that tell you which screws need to be removed to get the set apart. So it looks like there are two screws here at the back where the uh, antenna connection was, there would have been some rabbit ears. Actually, when I got this, there were some rabbit ears attached to this, but they were very broken. So I actually got rid of those. Uh, there are a couple more arrows right here. This probably holds on this rear port, input port thingamajiggy. I see two more arrows here on this little plate for the RF inputs. I've already taken out 10 screws. <laughs> I don't even, I doubt there's uh, all of them out yet. There's probably some on the bottom as well. 
I, there's one here and one here that has to come out. Oh, and there's a little arrow right here and one right there to tell you to not miss those. That is super cute. So I've looked inside of some monitors like this before. I think one was made by Sears. I don't think I made a video about it, but I can tell you one thing. Inside the set, it was an unbelievable spaghetti mess of wires and circuit boards. And it made it really, really difficult to work on. And that monitor did need a little TLC. It had like some bad solder joints and stuff. And wow, was it hard to take apart. So look at that, that just slides right off. I'll have to feed the video or the power cable through the hole here. Well, in the back, one of the niceties, there's a parts diagram right here. It's barely holding on. Maybe I can just pull this off altogether. There it is. Maybe I should scan this in. <laughs> I don't know how many people um, have access to this. Of course, uh, if you have one of these monitors, it will be most likely on the inside or maybe it would have fallen off. So it's just floating around in there. I know it's gonna be hard to read, but there is a list of the component number here, which matches up to numbers that are on this side. And then it lists what the actual component is, like the part name or number. And then here it actually lists the function as well. Pulse amplifier, et cetera, et cetera. Very nice, very nice of Panasonic to do that. All right, well, looking inside here, it's uh, very dusty. Now, is that because of use or because of storage? Now, the ventilation slots that were on the top of the case would allow dirt just to fall straight into this. So a lot of the dirt that was on the top of this would have just ended up inside as well. But there is definitely signs that this thing has a lot of hours on it. And here's a good example. Here's the flyback high voltage cable here. And you see this little plastic thingy here? It's like a spacer. That should be white. And it is completely blackened uh, with this soot. So this thing was used a lot. All right, so let's take a look at what we can see right off the bat. So here's the neck board that has some of the drive controls that we can access through the back. There is an extra control, at least one, that you can get to uh, with that metal cover removed. It doesn't have a label here, but it's a potentiometer of some kind. Then we have this large PCB here, which obviously is the computer input, video, audio, switching stuff, probably has the on-screen display as well. Lots of little capacitors. These don't seem like the light uh, purple color ones that typically leak on Panasonic sets. So that's a good thing, I suppose, maybe. I don't immediately see any that look like they're leaking. And of course, on a set like this, that's very high hour. You always want to suspect any capacitor that's very close to something that gets very hot. This board on its own probably doesn't have a whole lot of those. Let's pop this neck board off the CRT. You can kind of see all the soot here for the high hourness of this. Uh, are there electrolytics on here? No, there are not. So that's good. I am curious what this control is. This might be a screen control, like the screen control that's often down on the flyback, which is behind this board here. Looking at the parts diagram here, none of these boards seem to match up with the neck board here. So I don't think I can tell what that adjustment is. There's definitely some heat generated on here. This stuff here looks very baked, like the PCB itself is sort of darkened. And there's the power resistor right here, another one there, another one there. So that section probably gets quite toasty. All right, we can see lots of soot here on that part of the CRT. And then uh, we got more boards. Yeah, so metal chassis in here, hence the, the weight I was talking about. So all of this here, nice solid metal. Looks like this set is somewhat serviceable. You would probably loosen this screw and this screw and this back PCB probably could flip down. It's probably long enough wires for that. So I'm gonna give that a try real quick. All right, actually, it looks like there's quite a lot of wire tie downs you have to undo to get this board out of here. Because as I was saying, there is an unbelievable spaghetti mess of wires down in there. This set has this big board, has a board right here, has a board on this side, it has a board on the bottom, this little control thing here for the, the tuner or whatever that was. I think there, that's it. There might be another little board at the front. I think it looked like uh, on the parts list there for the receive, the remote receiver. So yeah, it's so densely packed, it's really gonna be hard to work on this thing if it has an issue. It goes without saying that this board right here is gonna be the power supply, because I see a transformer there. This will of course be an isolated set, so it has a switching power supply. That is required if you're going to have video inputs here, and of course the RGB input right there. And that would be because this set was probably designed for the US market, but also the Japanese market, probably has a very close 
relative to this. And in Japan, pretty much all of their plugs are two pin. Uh, they don't have the three pin plug that the US has, or maybe they do now. I don't think in the 80s they did. It was all pretty much two pin. And I don't think it was polarized as well. So you never knew if you flip this around, you were gonna end up with a live chassis uh, if you had something that was not isolated design like this is. And I can see right up here, there's a B plus adjustment. So of course that does imply that this is the power supply for the main part of the monitor. But I'm noticing here, there's also a large transformer. So what's that doing over there when there's a transformer here on the set as well? Down here at the bottom on this bottom PCB that's along the bottom of the set has the flyback. So that's gonna be the main part of the set that runs the CRT itself, like the deflection circuitry and the drives and stuff like that. You can kind of tell because the neck board here, which of course drives the cathodes that generate the image, it runs off down to that lower board. It's not coming from this board right here, which is the case sometimes. That's probably because there's a version of this as well that doesn't have all this digital audio video input. It's just a tuner. And that is coming off that main board down there. Now there is one more board over here next to this transformer. And I guess that's the tuner control board. That might be have to do with the remote and stuff because it looks like this little top control panel here, it all plugs into that. And maybe this transformer here is because it has a separate supply that just runs that when the whole set is turned off and this stuff is all inactive. So that probably has to do with the remote control and the digital tuner and all that, all that good stuff. Probably again, because there's a version of the set that doesn't have that stuff and it wouldn't need these boards. So they kind of modularize things, which was very typical back in the days as, as a way to make the set versatile where you could add and remove parts. You have these different boards which can be added and removed and jumpered out when they're not needed for a particular set configuration. Give it a quick gander in here. I can't really film in there because it's just so dense. I'm just gonna try to look to see if anything looks blown up or out of the ordinary, like capacitors that aren't looking good, things like that. So far, so good. And everything seems to be these dark blue caps here, which I'm assuming are gonna be Panasonic brand. It has a triangle logo on it, so I don't quite know. Things do look okay, just from a cursory inspection. I'm gonna plug this neck board back on. I'm just gonna tilt the whole monitor up onto its side. Look how dirty my fingers are getting here. I just wanted to take a look at the bottom and just see what we're looking at when it comes to bad solder joints. Oh, how nice. It has full access to the bottom of the board. Panasonic, that rocks. So right here on this part, it's where the flyback is and those solder joints look fine. Now, of course it has little inserts in the PCB that give those pins extra purchase and really grab onto them. Now, there might be problems with the connectors that go with the wires that go between these things. Those don't always have that. Now, there are some ICs down here, a bunch of board-to-board -board interconnects. So if there are intermittent problems where, you know, hitting the side of the set makes it come back, definitely we'll focus on all these board-to-board -board interconnects here. The worst are when you have a small PCB that's stuck into another PCB at a right angle. Those always seem to get bad solder joints over time. I don't think this has any of those though. It just has lots of board-to-board -board interconnects. It's using these MELF resistors down here. So it's sort of like a early surface amount technology. This is probably something to do with the AGC right here, which is why it has extra shielding on it. They did label what stuff is. So there's the service switch. We have sub brightness, RF AGC, UAGC. Now, one thing I noticed looking at the bottom of this set is it looks like there would have been some type of a tilt stand that was possible for this. Uh, it looked like Maybe it was a bar that actually went in this front part of the set right here. There's little notches there. And then the little holes here, it says recess for stand, which probably had little feet and it would probably stick into there if you folded it back down against the bottom of the monitor. So it would tilt up the front for computer use. Obviously that is missing, I don't have that. But everything on the PCB here looks good. I don't see any dodgy solder joints. Nothing is blown up or it looks like it's been destroyed here. No burn traces, none of that stuff. So I think uh, this set, it's ready to plug this in, see if this thing works. Before I plug this in, one of the things that I found on sets that are early 80s sets that are remote control sets, ones with momentary power switches like this one, is that circuitry, which is on this PCB over here, bakes over time, just it's running all the time. And that means that any capacitors on there are really more likely to be dried out than anything else on the set. And that can cause problems. So like if I go to turn this on, and that power switch doesn't seem to do anything at all. 
I'm going to suspect that there's a problem on this board over here with a capacitor that's uh, completely baked. And that makes the power supply that needs to run for the microcontroller or whatever this thing uses to turn on and off not work. All right, here we go. I'm going to reach over here and plug this in. Okay, didn't make any horrible noises or do anything, which is a good sign potentially. But let's see what happens here. <laughs> it turned on. Now I'm going to keep my finger on the power button in case there's no deflection. There is deflection. All right. Uh, okay. <laughs> let's see here. TV video. Uh, that doesn't look great. I'm going to say there's a definitely looks like there's some kind of a fault here. Channel indicator is way off the top of the screen there. I happen to have a video signal right here. So let's switch this to TV video. All right, there we go. There is the video signal. Now it looks like a disaster. Let me turn off this light here. It looks pretty good, but the color is just, of course, way off. I think someone has been fiddling with these controls. Okay, that one is working. All right, I think these controls are quite dirty. This is the tint control right here. Oh yeah, that needs some deoxid, all right, and there's way too much color. Oh yeah, these controls are scratchy. Color pilot, okay, so that's the uh, auto color and that doesn't do a great job. <laughs> Here is the brightness control itself, and then this is the Panabrite, and it's definitely just um, acting like contrast. Um, you know what? <laughs> this thing has a pretty good image. I mean, it's still out, the, the color balance is off, and the tint is off. Wow, 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 wow. I am shocked. I was assuming that this thing was just not gonna be great. Yeah, it looks like the color balance is off just because the CRT has aged. Looks like the red is stronger than the blue and the green, so it kind of gives everything like a pink tint, like this white part here. But wow, I am completely shocked. Let's see about this on-screen display. Okay, there's like the volume control button. Uh, the up button is not really working. If I push it a bunch of times, it does work. Uh, there's a computer button here that just switches to the RGB, which of course is not there. It's almost certain that the computer mode does not have any on-screen displays. So if I push the volume control here and I push computer, oh, it does. Wow. Okay, yep, <laughs> look at that. Oh, it's just, look, it totally works. <laughs> it's so chunky. It is so chunky. Look at this. <laughs> look. <laughs> I love it. I have looked the font. It's so hilarious. Let's get this a little closer so you can really see that that chunktastic font. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I am shocked. This thing has a really nice image. Wow. So there's a matrix and it is looking good. Like I said, just the uh, the drive controls. It needs an alignment there. It has a great image. Just the color balance is off because it's just uh, the CRT is aged, but it's it is bright. It is sharp. It's not blooming. <laughs> I'm amazed. I'm totally amazed. Panasonic, you know how to make good stuff. So if I turn this off, turn it back on again. There it is. I don't love that when the raster collapses, it has that really bright line in the center. That right there because that can possibly burn in the screen over time. I have another monitor that does that. And actually you can see where this image has been burned in over time, just because that really bright flash that you get there actually can wear out the phosphor. It's possible that a good trick with a CRT like this would be to switch to computer mode here and we turn it off. Okay, it's still bright, but it's not as bright. I love the chunk-tastic on-screen display. That is awesome. All right, I'm gonna leave this just running like this for a little while, and I'm gonna let this um, kind of uh, not burn in, but you know, get those capacitors reformed, get the CRT kind of waking up and whatnot. Turn the brightness down just a little bit. Uh, you really should allow some time for something like this to warm up before you do any other adjustments on the back. All right, so I had this thing running for maybe 30 minutes, no issues, picture looked good still. I did just slightly tweak 
the controls on here, I turned down the red drive and the red low light, which is the bias, and I actually made the picture look fantastic. Color balance is spot on, at least to my eyes right now. There's also a sub brightness control that was right here. I just turned that up slightly, which made the brightness on the front work a bit better. Basically, I had to crank the brightness up on the front to make the overall picture bright enough. I'm not sure why that was dim. Could be just aging of the CRT. Anyhow, what the problem is now is those pots on the front are all a little scratchy, and it doesn't look like there's any way you can get to those, uh, easily at least. So I think this entire chassis has to kind of come out of this, the set a little bit. And it looks like there are a couple screws, one right here and one on the other side. And I think the entire metal chassis that holds everything slides out and that should reveal potentially uh, what's on the front. Okay, we have a couple ground leads there. So I'm just gonna unhook those. And there's a similar screw on the other side. So just taking that out, there are no ground leads on this one. And I think the whole thing slides out now. Yep, it certainly does. Now it looks like this transformer up here, I do have the mains um, unhooked by the way. There it is right there. Looks like this transformer here has a bunch of wires tied onto it. What's holding this on? Okay, this is actually attached to the chassis itself. What's preventing this from sliding out? Nothing, it does slide out fine. Okay, now it's just, I think just caught up on wires. <laughs> That's it. I think this is caught up on wires. Yeah, this transformer here, I will need to take these two screws out. Okay, yeah, this entire assembly here was attached on those top screws. This is also held on to the main chassis as well. And then this just does kind of come out. There's just a ton of wires attached to everything. Like the speaker here. Oh, and I gotta put the gloves back on. <laughs> Cause the filth, the filth is real. So we just twist these little wire things here to kind of get them apart. Should be able to get the speaker wire out. There it is. It's connected down way down there. So luckily there's enough length here. Should be able to slide this out a bit more. So here's the chassis and it's all just sort of loose. Um, but in there, there's a giant bundle of wires that kind of goes to the front controls. And that is what this is hanging up on right now. And I'm assuming I'm supposed to take this PCB off and that gives me access to put my hands in there and kind of release those wire ties that are holding those bundles of wires uh, in, you know, there's more length available, but you can kind of get an idea maybe at the ridiculous bundle of cables that are in there. It's gonna be impossible to see with the camera, but I can see the little circuit board. There's a PCB in there that has all the potentiometers all the way down at the front. And you literally have to remove everything here to get to that. All of this has to come out and there are so many wire ties down in there. And I just don't know if I wanna go through that much effort to get this thing apart just to clean those pots. You know what, this chassis actually lifts up now that it's sort of out of the grooves and it's possible if I put this set on this side, I can actually get a screwdriver to that front panel kind of through the gap in the bottom here and get that thing out. I'm gonna try that. So I have the neck board unhooked here, it's just hanging here. Just one less thing to bump into the CRT and potentially damage it. And now you can see that through this gap here, there's the PCB that's along the front. So now I need to try to get that off. Let's try to move this out of the way a little more. There might only be one screw holding the control panel on. The buttons are also a little finicky. They're like probably little momentary buttons. Not sure if deoxit's gonna help those but these pots will be very much helped by deoxid. Well, there it is. The little PCB is out and that was not easy. There are three screws that hold it in, but there are clips all the way along the bottom as well. And I sort of had to bend the, the plastic and then it came out. And yeah, these are really dirty. So no wonder why it's not working well. There is also the momentary switch here for the power button on the front. And you can just see this whole thing is really sooty. So I'm gonna try to clean this up a little bit and uh, hopefully that will <laughs> make it work a little better. I'm gonna use this stuff here, QD Electric Cleaner. Now it is flammable. 
or inflammable, whatever. It's You don't want to use this on energized things because it can uh, light and ignite and cause problems. But it's safe for plastic and it evaporates pretty quickly, I think. So um, let's try to use this. It doesn't leave a film, unlike uh, deoxit. I'm going to use my gloved hand here. Actually, let me get a, this here, put that there to sop up any extra that flows off. A lot of it sprays around, so that's one of the issues. So we'll get that in there, into the button. And then as for these... Oh wow, yeah, that freed it up. Those were pretty gummed up feeling, like the grease in there. And now it's just like, woo, those turn very free. So obviously that has gotten inside there. I think this kind of washes away any grease that's in there though. So let's just make sure these turn nice and free, which they do. All right, this is the Deoxit Fader Lube I was talking about. This sort of has a lubricant in here. It's designed for faders like on audio mixing boards. I think it works quite well inside pots. I'm not gonna spray it inside that switch there, but just, get some in there. Now this uh, this other stuff is already all dried up. Like there's no more liquid on here at all. These are completely dry. So, oh, I can go in the bottom here. Spray a little bit in there. This kind of replaces the nice lubricant in there just to keep them with a nice film on there and get them turning nice and smooth. Now they're already turning smoothly because that other stuff kind of washed away that gummed up grease that was in there. But these should be nice and lubricated now, thanks to the fader lube. All right, now that I've cleaned this, the problem is I don't want to run the set like with it all sort of half hanging out like this. So I think I'm gonna hope that I did the right thing um, with this and the fader lube, and that these are basically nice and clean and working again. So I'm gonna try the long and arduous process to reinstall this and of course the headphone jack, which I should spray some deoxid into here. Or maybe I'll just use some of this uh, stuff in there as well. All right, this goes in first. I'm not gonna film it because it's fiddly and impossible to film. So hopefully when I get back, it'll be in there. Well, all right, this thing is back together. I also took it outside and I used my air compressor to blow a lot of the dust off of it as well. All right, so it's now time to test this out. I just wanna flip it around. So I'm gonna slide a cloth under it again because um, this anti-static mat, it's soft. So things dig dig in, heavy things like the CRT, <laughs> like this monitor. Ooh, that is so ridiculously heavy. All of these controls are turned all the way down to their minimum. That way it's not like super bright picture or whatever, and I'll adjust it. See if this still works. Well, turned on, so that's a good sign. Turned off the light there, the overhead light. All right, so we have the, the on-screen display, but no picture. But that's okay, I think, because we have the brightness and the contrast turned all the way down. All righty. The controls definitely appear to be working properly. There is the brightness. And there is the color. And there is the tint. No more scratchy controls. That is excellent. Uh, the automatic color is like it's terrible. It just blows it out. It looks way too much color. This is the automatic vertical hold, which is interesting. So if I turn V hold all the way to one way, there it is. And then push the button and there it is. I don't know why you'd want that unless it could be that because maybe this thing can take a 50 hertz signal. And of course that would cause it to roll. So you have to adjust the control. So maybe with the auto, it just locks on. And if you're using a computer that outputs 50 and 60 hertz, then you just don't have to worry. All right, so the cleaning of the controls was an absolute success. I hadn't used this stuff before, this QD cleaner, uh, but that really did the trick, and I have used this before. Good lubricant, the stuff's pretty expensive, but it definitely works. So one thing I am noticing, it seems like there's like a little bit of a ripple going on here. Let me put on a full field image. All right, there's a solid gray image, and there is a little bit of a ripple, and that's gonna be caused by a bad capacitor. Uh, that's just lost some of its value. So it, you get a bit of ripple as the beam shuts off to do the retrace and then starts again. But I'm also noticing there's definitely like a muddled appearance to the phosphor. And I'm really thinking that's just because this thing is very high hour set 
and there's really nothing I can do about it. It's not on the outside of the glass here, and I've cleaned it using Magic Eraser, which can get off any kind of grime that's stuck on the glass. It's definitely on the underside. And if I shut the set off, I can actually see that mottled appearance. It's not gonna show up in the camera, but there's just little, I don't know what it is, either burning or it's just the phosphor is worn out in, in splotches for some reason. So that's unfortunate, but there's not much I can do about that. All right, so let's test out the tuner here. So this definitely, <laughs> it's funny how it just shows like a giant number here. Uh, I'm gonna hook a VCR up to this thing. All right, the VCR is right here. Let's turn this on. That's not great right there. <laughs> Let's turn this off of cable TV and switch it over to TV. Oh, look, that did the trick. All righty. That's actually not, it's still on cable TV, but it's on standard. So there it is. That's over the air right there. Nice, okay. Let's see what's on this tape here. It is possible that I recorded this tape in Super VHS mode. And this VCR I just plugged in is not a Super VHS VCR. It's almost like I recorded nothing onto this tape. Oh, there we go. And yes, Super VHS. Uh, that's what happens when you play a Super VHS tape in a non-Super VHS VCR. Obviously, it's one of my own videos here. I needed some like copyright-free content. I'm gonna grab a Super VHS VCR so we can play this properly. Try number two, the Super VHS VCR I feature on the second channel that I got for, I think, $10. So let's get this tape out of the bottom VCR. Actually keep this one upstairs because I like how uh, narrow it is. It fits on my little TV cart a lot better than these uh, big Panasonic ones. Uh, let's hit play. There's my intro. All right, so I'm gonna turn the volume down. This TV is absolutely working great. So I'm gonna reinstall the glass now and it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty dirty. So let's uh, use a little Windex and clean the inside and the out. All right, the inside that faces the CRT is nice and clean now. And here are the little clips that hold that on. All right, I just have one of them loosely put there. I'm uh, gonna try to clean them because these are themselves are a little crusty. All right, it's a little bit fiddly to get those back on, but now that they're on, I think I just kind of pushed them like that. that. That latched in, and this one, there we go. Two latched in for the front glass, nice! I can imagine on a set like this that these little clips that hold the glass on are easy to break and easy to lose. So I'm glad that they're both on this set here. All right, with the Super VHS VCR, it's looking good. And I can switch between RF and video and they both look really good, no issues. I'm noticing that while it's on video, you can push computer to switch to the RGB input. I don't have a cable, so I can't test that. And if you're on RF and you push the computer button, it doesn't actually do anything. So this is obviously all talking to that microcontroller that's on this thing and then using all those switching ICs that you see all around here. You'll notice here I set the time as well, 920. I just randomly put in a random time. I don't even know what this 00 stands for over here. Maybe that's the day of the month or maybe it's a sleep timer and it's only something you can do from the remote control. All right, there we have it. There is a wonderful 80s-tastic Panasonic television. It's all back together again. Uh, that glitching, by the way, is the tape, so don't worry about that. This thing's looking good. I cleaned it up. The glass is nice and clean. I mean, the only thing that's a blemish, honestly, is the missing door. Oh, what a shame, because this thing is a looker. I just love the silver paint, the glass with the black surround on the CRT. It's just so cool and it really screams 80s. They were just getting out of that wood grain 70s vibe and trying to be futuristic with this style. I looked up the RGB connector, it's right there on the screen. It's an EIAJ eight pin video connector. And uh, there's the pin out on there for the digital RGB that's almost certainly on this monitor. If I get the right cable, I can hook this up to an EGA or a CGA card, of course set to 15 kilohertz for the EGA. I don't know if this supports the right brown that CGA does. It might just have a bright yellow and a dark yellow because this might've been designed more for Japanese style computers that had digital RGB. And I don't know if that brown thing was common outside of the IBM CGA card. This thing would look amazing in like a mock 80s bedroom hooked up to an old 8-bit computer. Although I have to say this thing must've been really, really expensive for its time compared to even the expensive say Commodore monitor it's just the fact that like everything in the kitchen sink is in this monitor just probably made it a very costly thing. 
Before I end this video, I was actually just doing some Googling, looking for the CTF-1465R to see if anyone else had talked about this monitor, has this monitor, anything. Can't find a single mention of it, no hits on Google, nothing. There's this link here, CTF-1465R television by Toshiba valuation report. What? And then just these like search engine optimization sites that just give you a bunch of crap basically. Here's a list of Panasonic model numbers of just everything. And there it is, uh, CTF-1465R uh, TV, it just says service. I think this site's trying to sell you a service manual. There's a 13 inch version, 19 inch versions, 20 inch versions. I did see a picture on Reddit of the 20 inch version that someone had. It looks like the Omni series had a whole bunch of different sets. Uh, listings after the table, Panasonic manuals available, really. And here's an excerpt from Byte Magazine, May 1984. And then there's a little section right here. For complete TV VCR computer system package, Panasonic's consumer division offers the Omni series. These sets are intended to compete with Sony's Profeel product line. The most interesting unit in the series is the CTF-1465R, which will retail for about $680. It has a built-in TV tuner as well as VCR cable, computer, and even IBM interface connections. You can choose between composite and RGB signals. It also has remote control, on-screen display, or on-screen clock, and even a timer to turn off <laughs> the late show after you nod off. That's gotta be like that zero zero that we saw in the corner there. That must be the timer. Meant as a multi-use receiver monitor, it has a very good picture at 0.42 millimeter dot pitch and more than 350 lines of horizontal resolution in the composite mode. And it says you might want to wait until the 1495 monitor is released in the summer. It's essentially the same, it just has no tuner and has the ability to display teletext and video text. How cool is that? So $680 in 1984. That's interesting, what's going on there? I wonder if that's the VCR. I think I recorded this tape on a different VCR than this. And I'm assuming that that problem right there is not the TV set. Let's see, that's probably the VCR. This is again, it's like that Super VHS ET mode. Although it just says Super VHS there. So who knows what's going on there. I went to go look up how much $680 1984 is today and the inflation calculator that the uh, US government has online doesn't work. But according to this inflation calculator here, it says that $680 1984 is the equivalent of $1,856 in today's money. That was an expensive computer monitor right here. Very pricey. I really can't imagine that Panasonic sold very many of these, which is probably why you really don't find them anymore today. And it probably means that I will never ever find the door for this or the remote control. So that is gonna be it for this video. I hope you found my look at this awesome looking 80s Panasonic monitor TV thing interesting. If you like this video, thumbs up. Don't forget to check out the main channel. I'd really appreciate a subscribe on the second channel here if you haven't done that already. It really helps me out. And of course, huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen over here. If you wanna become a patron, you can do so at the link in the description in the, <laughs> the link in the description below. Uh, comment if you ever had one of these awesome uh, Omni series TVs. And uh, yeah, that's gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.